Harold, thank you for coming. Um, I know it's been a long few days, and there's another day left. Half a day, so I'm excited. Um, this mic's really cool. Feels like I need to start singing. <laughs> um, so I'm Simon. Uh, I like to make stuff, and lately I've been thinking a lot about art and creativity, and I want to share some ideas around building new markets in the arts. I'm going to cover three broad topics in this talk. Um, ideas around new kinds of property rights. Um, and the meat of it will be around generative economies, new ways to generate and co-create art together. And the final one is a bit in a weirder tangent, which is seeing markets as a medium for art. So just before I start, just to caveat, there's been a lot of amazing stuff that's been done in this space. It's not entirely exhaustive. Um, and it's not doing some of the things that have been done so far in this space. Um, things like secondary sales, which is awesome. Good crowdfunding mechanisms of simpler forms of talk tokenization. And just thanks to, to a bunch of people that have written a lot in this space. People like Rob Myers, um, MP and Stina, and Ruth Katlaub from Further Field. There's been a lot of people doing amazing things. So let me start with intellectual property. Um, intellectual property as is, as we understand it today. We all have this idea that whatever we create eventually goes into the public domain. This, this is for copyright, the case. Eventually, Mickey Mouse will get into the public domain after Disney stops lobbying. Um, and then um, we also have the principle of patents. Patents are privately exploitable for a while and then becomes be able to be exploited by anyone in the market. Now, the way we design this is that we kind of guess how long people should exploit such intellectual property. In the case of copyright, it depends where you're in the world, but maybe think in the US it's like after you die, plus 70 years or something like that. It's like it's pretty arbitrary when you think about it. So there was some new proposals with regards to asset property ownership by Glenn Weil and Eric Posner from uh, Radical Markets that proposed different ways to property rights. It was initially targeted towards like, more traditional asset ownership, but I think it could be applied to intellectual property as well, which essentially creates a market for the ability to privately exploit intellectual property, and if it's not being privately exploited, it goes back into the commons. And back into the commons. And this kind of property rights um, is called Harberger rights. It's named after Arnold Harberger. And no, it's not Harbinger rights or Hamburger rights, it's Harberger rights. So this guy invented this model where it essentially works as follows. Once you own the property, whatever it is, it's in this case intellectual property, you have to always specify a sale price upon which someone can buy it from that owner, but they can't choose like $5 billion as a price because you have to pay a tax on it based on the price you set. So it means that ideally the price goes towards a level which is fair market, fair market pricing, but the person that owns it, um, yeah, at any point someone could buy from them at their price. So the person as the owner constantly have to evaluate the price of their asset. So I thought this was a really interesting idea. Um, it's perhaps not readily implementable in the current traditional world, but I thought why not try and create something like this for digital art, digital art collectibles. And why not use this beautiful thing called the blockchain and Ethereum to allow us to experiment with this. So I thought Let's try this out and I created a project called This Artwork is Always on Sale. And that is the actual artwork itself. And it's self-referential. And I created it and I launched it in March and April. And there was uh, interest in the artwork and it's still available to be bought. And it's currently valued at around $40,000. And the great thing about this model is that why I started it is that like the secondary sale model, where every sale of the artwork generates revenue for the artist, in this case, every second, I earn revenue from the fact that someone decides to hold it as a digital collectible. So this is an interesting model, and since then, other people have started using this model in other domains, such as conservation, like you own a digital rhino, and the, the, the money you pay gets given to rhino conservation, so it's not like an art piece. But what's interesting about this model and why Harbour Rights were created in the first place is it asks the question, what things ought to be owned in the commons? And I think that's where it gets particularly interesting in the case of Ethereum because 
when you look at Ethereum, we often design markets for multiple participants to enter and exit as they wish. So the question becomes, what can we build that ought to be owned in the commons that is related to art? In the past in Ethereum, there have been interesting experiments related to this. I don't think many people might remember this experiment, but it was, it's still running on Ethereum, but it's called The Universe Explodes. And it's a book. It's a book where if you have a copy of the book, there's like a few copies of the book. If you have the book, you have the right to remove some words and write some new words in the book. But you, there's, there's, you, can, only, you can add less words than you, than you take out. So over time, this universe explodes and the book becomes essentially nothing. So all versions of the book essentially gets written out of existence. So people can buy and sell this book. So that's a good example for me of what Commons art can be. With Ethereum, you can buy and sell specific versions of this book. And then we also have things like Pixel Maps, which is famous on the internet for Commons art. Everyone is available to build and edit specific pixels. But none of this currently on the internet is built in such a way that the people who co-created this could actually earn anything from it. It's just a collective experience. But with things like hardware attacks, to the process of owning maybe specific sections of a pixel map, you could buy and sell and participate and co-create value together. Then there was also projects in the space, things like Solarius, uh, which was incredibly, uh, which is incredibly fascinating. I think it's still very unexplored. The ability to co-create stories together, build collective universes, and we've seen in almost any popular. Um, Media production, there's fan fiction. So much, so much fan fiction. And the process of legitimizing fan fiction as part of the canon of the story um, hasn't really been done so much, but also just the ability to say to people, let's incentivize the co creation of art together and collective storytelling. So I think that's still a space that's largely unexplored. The next one I want to touch upon, which is the meat of this talk, is the production of generative economies in art. And I think the most important thing here is we have this economic incentive engines that we build on Ethereum that could use that we could use to incentivize people to generate algorithms to make us go find interesting art, interesting patterns that exist in this you know adjacent possible space. And what's been done so far is there's, there's people that have done stuff in this space, which is quite interesting. And it's the following kind of map. It's pre-generated, it's auto-generated. And then the final one, which has started being done, is the incentivization of these kind of generations. So one of the first ones was the project called CryptoPunks. I'm sure some of you might be familiar with this. In CryptoPunks, there were about 10,000 of these created, but they were done randomly. So there's like different parts of the makes of CryptoPunks and put together, and then it was released. So, in this case, generated artwork that was pre-generated. Autoglyphs was a similar project by the same guys, um, where they created 512 generated artworks. But what they did here that was new and different was that they actually put the, the code to produce the artwork in the smart contract itself. So if you take the specific C input, this, there is this literally code that will generate these pieces of art. So there is no separate file that does an IPFS that represents this artwork. It's actually all in Solidity. Then there is a similar project called Generative, which also uses a similar thing to Autoglyphs, produces cake compositions based on a specific hash. And then there was a project called Crypto, which kind of took um, input from CryptoKitties, where you would have anime characters be able to be combined and bred into new anime characters and it used machine learning models to generate these new versions of these anime characters. So there, in this case, we started combining the fact that if you have one of these, you can generate new ones. Before I get to the holy grail, there's another component that's been started, which is the ability to use these collective organizational models, DAOs, to basically incentivize people to produce com um, commission artworks to be created. So here in um, the Ethereum, there was a DAO Saka, sorry, DevCon, there was a DAO Saka um, experiment. There's also other ones called Trojan DAO, and there's um, also DAO Vinci. There's several of them ones trying this out where essentially people pull money together, 
and then commission any artist anywhere in the world to create works together. And when these are sold, some of the money goes back into the DAO. So people can choose proposals to create art together. Now when you take generative economies, machine learning, uh, algorithmic generation of art, you combine it with DAOs, you get what Trent McGonaghy from Ocean calls AI art DAOs. This is where it gets fun and weird and amazing. Um, so essentially, um, some of the first designs, this one design I made called Eponymous, um, it's, there was a prototype built at ETH Berlin last year, where essentially is, there is a, a, a DAO that creates these digital artworks through a generative algorithm, and then it pays people to improve its algorithm. So over time, you would have new artworks being produced, and it would incentivize software developers to upgrade it to produce new artworks. Perhaps the most interesting one recently that is a production that's really great is really, really when it comes to clovers, um, which is really great. Which is these pictures that you see, if you're not familiar with it, is finished end games of Othello or Reversi, depending what you call it. And because um, there's many of them that exist, many end states of this game, you collect the various ones. And because it generates interesting patterns, you could find either some the, the most sort of after ones are the symmetrical ones because it's we are humans, we like patterns. Um, but what's great about this example is that it incentivizes people to run these simulations on their computers to generate these interesting versions. And it has a built-in economy behind it where it incentivizes people to go out and generate them through a DAO-like system using one curves. So super, super great experiment and it's also just really fun. I think they did a really good job with the user experience where they um, incentivize people to run these things to collect these interesting pieces of work. So this is like the start of something where we start combining everything together to get quite interesting outcomes. Now, when you combine all these things together, there's still one piece that's kind of missing. And this is where um, um, people like Gene Kogan, who created machine learning for artists, started combining all these components together and added one final piece which is the ability to add a philosophy of the mind in the artworks that's being created. And it's a project called Abraham and AI. He's written amazing medium pieces that des describes this whole project. And what it is, you have digital art, crypto economics, machine learning and artificial intelligence, and then philosophy of mind to combine it together to essentially have what, as he describes it, which is a more palatable version, an artist in the cloud. And how it works is where the philosophy of mind comes in is that the machine learning, or the, the, the generative algorithm, is federated. So it's not one person owns the mind of this artist, so it's scattered among many computers. And when artworks are generated, they are um, put together in, by these different sets, and the model keeps being improved such that over time, you have this artist creating artworks, software developers improving this artist, it's making money for the people involved, and it ends up being a completely autonomous artificial artist. So I find this extremely, extremely fascinating. Um, I think this is a holy grail of ideas together where I hope in the next five years we will see the first artist that, that lives out there that is, you know, sells a few million dollar artworks that um, we don't quite understand. It's quite a fascinating idea. Um, so Abraham AI exists and there's a forum and People can go discuss. Gene comes from the machine learning world, so he's been trying to get these ideas in the crypto economic space, so it's going to get quite interesting. And then the final part, which is perhaps a bit stranger kind of request, not really a request, but I think it's an interesting space to explore, which is looking at markets as a potential medium for art. Just because of the fact that in Ethereum we constantly deal with transactions, like we call transactions, so if it's adapted to social network, we call it a transaction. Everything is about finance. Everything you have to do, you have to pay. There's always a market in everything. But we, it rarely has markets been seen as a part, as an art medium, mostly because we tend to see it as it, as it, um, it's a, it, it destroys the value of art sometimes, where people see there's this transaction to this experience and it devalues the experience. But I think in that, we can also create art experiences. And what's, inter 
What's interesting is that many people might not realize this, but there is a lot of interesting things to see in markets. And obviously the first one that we are quite familiar with is like traditional technical analysis. In our works, people have these words for these patterns, the descending triangle, the head and shoulders, the various forms of like clouds that you can term various trader term terminology that you can see. And people don't just see normal technical analysis in these things, they get creative. You know? yeah. It's like this is a dinosaur movement, um, which is quite funny. And then there's also just a form for using markets as protest art in South Africa. There was a company that was implicated in state capture. And it, when it was done, the company got de delisted, but you could still trade in it through paper shares on the side. So this guy thought, you know what? Like, screw this company for doing all the shit that they did in South Africa. And he started trading this beautiful fuck you to the company in protest form. Um, he actually got sued because, like, apparently it was manipulation, but. Um, <laughs> Um, and then, and then, like this, the following one is an experiment that I did, and uh, obviously, like in, in doing these kind of forms of art experiments, um, you sometimes wonder if you're just being pretentious dick. But uh, in this case, I thought it was just interesting to try. So my question was, could a prediction market be art? So it is a prediction market itself. So I created one in Boulder and asked the community, is this prediction market art? And the outcome would be if people say yes, it would be art. If people say no, it won't be art. It ran for about a month. Uh, not a lot of people participated, but there were people participating in this. Uh, the final outcome was yes, people, the people that participated thought it was art. But the older community thought that this was not a relevant question or an invalid question. So they decided to mark it as invalid. So clearly the question itself is invalid. Like, we shouldn't even be asking if this is the case. So that was just a fun experiment that I enjoyed doing. Um, it's up to you guys to decide whether it's art or not. Then, the final, the final two parts is where you combine a market process to create art. Um, one of the interesting ones was the data um, network of artists creating a piece of art during a channel auction. So, a channel auction is, you have the rising bids in an English auction, and then a buy now price coming down in a Dutch auction. When these two meet in the middle, that's the price that someone pays for this art piece. But what's interesting in their experiment is the art didn't exist before the process started. So during the process of the, 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 the channel auction, the artwork was created. Because this buy now price comes down over time, it took about two hours for the auction to complete, and in that two hours, this art, but a bunch of artists together created this artwork, and when it was bought, it was shared among all the artists. So it was just an interesting process where, during the, the market process, the artists actually created. And then there was also um, an experiment from um, the conversion team, which essentially created bonding curve billboards, which was this strange experiment where you could buy a piece of ad space when it's under the line in the bonding curve, which is the price does in an automated market making mechanism. It might be meaningless, but I think it's just a good example of experimenting with ways in which you can combine art and markets in the same process. And perhaps in through that way, maybe take control back over the narrative of markets as being necessarily completely negative towards art. Um, yeah, that is, I <coughs> was so worried about not going over time that I was <laughs> went too fast. So I, have, I think I have time for like one question, if anyone has something interesting to add, or feel like saying that this is meaningless, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, can you explain your, your view as to like, what art is? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Do you have two hours, I think? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously anyone that's great art has thought about it before, and it's like, for me it's just, at the end of the day, um, art is just another form of language, right? So we try to convey something in, in a specific form, and sometimes language doesn't help us to do that. So, sometimes we need to make music to say something, sometimes we need to make memes to say something, 
sometimes we need to write a middle finger onto <laughs> technical analysis to say something. So yeah, that's that's my most minimal definition. Yeah. Yeah, so that's part of the process. Like once it starts being created, people go like, "This is either going to be the next like brilliant artwork, or it's going to not be good." Yeah, and and some obviously you you might also know the artist beforehand, so people might still go, like, "This is going to be good. This is going to be bad." So yeah, you know. and I think one last question. Yeah. Could you expand on the uh, autonomous uh, artist AI? What is the philosophy behind it? Is it um, are you infusing a mind and personality mm -hmm. or possibly into a it's it's piece of it, yeah it's more like it's more like in when you have these kind of generative algorithms um, if you just run the process because it's because it's usually deterministic if you put specific input in you will get a specific output so in that sense. The mind of the artist is known before it. It is written in stone, so to speak. So, in the case of philosophy of mind, it is where a certain input you would not necessarily know what the output would be until it's done. So, in generative algorithms, there is no space currently where you would be able to say that, like you would know, you would not know what the outcome would be in terms of the math. Yeah. It's just off, it's just mostly because it's federated learning, like you obfuscate the process enough that not one person in this process or one node in this process would be able to um, like know what the eventual artwork would look like. It's only when you bring all the pieces together that you would see this is what was created. So it's, it's a bit of a leap to say philosophy of mind, but it's just like the people that participate wouldn't necessarily know what the final outcomes would be. Okay, one last question, sure. Yeah. Um, just a general question if you or anyone else knows uh, a group, a channel, a feed where uh, crypto art and people are interested in um, just the blockchain in general or decentralization in general uh, meet, uh, share knowledge, uh, I guess just like an open channel where people can connect and is there a place to congregate on these topics? Hmm? I wonder if it's dedicated to art or... Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. For yeah, but, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's a bunch of platforms that have their communities, mm -hmm. uh, like Superair and Dada and these, these, these kind of uh, communities. Uh, I, I think it would be great if there is actually like a more central one that shares and do all these things. It could be. Uh, I maybe just haven't done enough research to find that. Yeah. Please say it up and you're interested. Yeah. Um, do you know of any project that utilizes composable um, crypto collectibles to create something like this, as opposed to have it be in one level, but like a hierarchy? Uh, like multiple layers of. Not currently familiar, but there might be. I might have seen it, but I'm not remembering now. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.